Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 29th, 2012, and my guest is Ed Yong. He is an award-winning science journalist. His blog at Discover Magazine is not exactly rocket science. Ed, welcome to Econ Talk. Hello. Thanks for having me. Now, you recently got entangled in a controversy over replicability in psychology, which is our first topic. Uh, That's right. We're going to talk about the reliability of, of scientific results and how that translates into journalism. And I want to start off with your experience um, in the psychology area and at a particularly well-known study that um, got complicated because of replicability. What happened there? So um, the original study was published in 1996. Um, it was by a man called John Barge, who is a very well-known so-called social psychologist. Um, and it showed that people who are primed uh, with um, words related to old age. So, if they see us, if you know, if they, if they're unconsciously exposed to these words, then um, they will walk more slowly down a corridor. So, it was, a, is, it was a pretty. This, sorry, go on. This was after the exper- The experiment was nominally about one thing, but actually was about something else. What the experimenters were interested in is when exactly. the experiment was over, if they'd seen words in the experiment that related to being old. They'd walk more slowly. And I have to say, Ed, it just doesn't pass the sniff test for me to start with. But it, it, <laughs> right. it was a very um, extremely uh, renowned study, correct? And highly very cited. renowned. It's been highly cited uh, you know, thousands of times. It's, it's there in most of the popular psychology books, um, the most popular psychology books of our time. Um, it, it's, you know, it's very well known. Um, but the amazing thing is that um, it's, very, it's been very seldom directly replicated, by which I mean that very few people have taken exactly what was done in the original experiment and reproduced it. Now, people have done slight tweaks uh, on, on the original um, and, and done other studies to show whether um, sim- similar trends would happen, so whether um, other unconscious exposures to different types of words could actually affect people's behavior. Um, so this takes us up to um, last, uh, no, actually the start of this year when I saw a paper um, which was a replication attempt of this seminal study um, which, which failed to repeat the original experiment. So this group in, uh, in, in Belgium, led by a man called Axel Clerimans, tried to reproduce the study. They tried to hew to the original design as far as possible, and they just couldn't see an effect. What, what they did see was that um, people only walked more slowly down the corridor if they had been... Um, if the experimenters in the experiment had been specifically told that that was what was going to happen. Um, so, so the idea was that um, if, if the experiments, if the experimenters uh, assume that the, these people are going to react by walking more slowly, then that's what they see. Now this, um, let's back up for a little bit. This phenomenon, of course, in psychology, um, uh, jargon is often everything. So this is called priming. Was this the first yeah. priming study or was there others before it? Now, I don't think it was the very first priming study, but I think it was it was a it was a big uh, a big moment in the field. Um, so it was a very important study in the priming literature. And since then, that you know, there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of studies using the same techniques. So, so the idea is basically that if you unconsciously expose people to certain stimuli, whether it's words or pictures, then it, it affects their behaviour. And you know, I, I I don't see anything particularly um, particularly uh, problematic with that concept. But but, but the example, uh, let's, let's go to the actual uh, the the actual barge experiment to make sure people understand it. So you'd have two groups. Yeah. One group would be primed, the other group not primed. In the primed group, they'd be given some exercise, and in the exercise, words like old, aged, senior, I don't know what else they used, but words that d- denoted being old, yeah. uh, would be used in the exercise, and the other group yes. would not get those words. They'd get different words that didn't suggest being old. And That's then right. the, the, image, the image I have is of the primed group then 
when they leave the experiment, they're what they're videotaped going down the corridor. They shuffle. And what's the what's the magnitude roughly of the difference between the two groups as they exit the experiment? One so group, um, yeah. in the in the original experiments, you would uh, they they had a um, they had one they had a person um, with a stopwatch timing them. Um, at the end of the corridor, and in the new versions, they had uh, infrared sensors, which are meant to, you know, which were used to hopefully try and give a more accurate reading. And what was what were the in the original experiment, the barge experiment? Uh, what were the some of the magnitudes of the differences between the two groups? Uh, I don't, I can't remember the size of the effect off the top of my but, head. But, but it was uh, large, it, right? It was it was dramatic. By, by the by the um, by the standards of these types of experiments, yeah, it was it was um, it was a pretty big effect. So what this replication study found was no effect unless you told the guy with the stopwatch to before they use the infrared. No, at, the guy the guy who asking the um, questions. Unless you tell the person who who ushers the volunteers into the experimental room, gives them a sort of um, envelope. Uh, you know, with all the test materials in it, if that person thinks that um, the experiment's going to show that priming reduces walking speed, then um, then they do walk some more slowly. Weird, right? It is weird. Yeah, um, slightly you know, alarming. <laughs> right, right. Um, but I think what what this what what was interesting about this what well, wasn't so much the specific details of the the replication attempt versus the original experiment it's sort of what what it opened up for me um in in terms of uh the sort of uh cultural norms of psychology so so I'll tell you what happened afterwards yeah go ahead um well, a few months after the paper came out um and my post came out um John, John Barge, the, the author of the original study, wrote uh, a very irate post on his own blog, um, which appears on Psychology Today. Um, and he uh, slated the research team behind the replication attempt. Uh, he, he criticized me for covering it. Um, and he criticized the journal it was published in, um, PLOS One. Um, and, uh, and, and it all sort of kicked off from there. And then I, I wrote a post in response to that. Um, several other commenters on, on Barge's post had pointed out certain um, inconsistencies in his analysis of the situation. Um, I wrote a response to that. And this kicked off a long discussion in, in the comments of my own blog about... Um, uh, about the role of replication in, in psychology. You know, I was, I was getting emails... Um, I was getting a few comments, but also lots of personal, private emails saying, oh, our labs um, tried to replicate this experiment and couldn't, or, you know, we know other labs who have also tried to do these replication attempts and failed. Um, and, it, and it sort of opened up this world for me of, of um, this undercurrent of, of failed replication attempts that are being done, um, that, well, that are, that are rarely being done, and when they are done, they they sort of circulate around water cooler gossip and never really see the light of day. And that seems to be really important because re- replication is one of you know is an act that should be a backbone of science. It's it's our way of checking to make sure that the stuff that enters the published literature is actually going to be true. Yeah, well, they call it social science, uh, <laughs> and my my field, economics, uh, we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. Ha- has the same issue, right? And we're not alone. Uh, this problem, as we'll see, uh, also leaks into so-called real sciences, uh, physical sciences, etc. But w- the the reaction, the the it, it's not surprising that the author of the study defended his own work. What was the reaction of other people who weren't what we might call uh, – what Adam Smith might call the impartial spectator. You, uh, <laughs> you had a, a stake in this. You'd, you'd written – you thought thoughtfully. I, I have to agree. Sure. I'm on your side. But Barge accused you of not of, you know, being gullible or whatever with the, was his attack on you. Yep. Uh, what kind of response did you get from other folks? Well, um, so, so a couple of things. Um, I, I think in general – um, one of the one of the strongest responses, one of the most frequent responses I got was, um, "I'm glad that people are talking about this issue. I'm glad that we're having a chance to bring this issue to light." 
Um, and uh, following on from this discussion, um, you know, I talked to a bunch of people and I did a little reading around. And I think there is this sort of seething undercurrent of um, unease about the current state of psychology and not, not from people outside the field who are looking in going, oh, social scientists, you know, aren't, right. uh, they're, you know they're not doing proper science. This is at, these are psychologists. These are people within the field um, worrying about the state of their own discipline. Um, and I find loads of these conversations going on, lots of uh, some, a few papers um, analyzing the issue, a lot of uh, blog posts, a lot of conference presentations, all talking about this. So it does seem that there, there is, there is a, a, you know, I, I don't know if there are a majority, but there is certainly a growing movement of people um, within the field who are discussing, uh, discussing this problem. Um, and then there were people who said that, you know, you're, this is all a waste of time because priming has been demonstrated again and again in lots of different studies. And, you know, it, it has been um, conceptually replicated is the term. And we can talk about the, um, what, what that means and what the issues are there later. No, you can talk about it now. What does that oh, mean? Oh, okay, sure, yeah. yeah <laughs> conceptually right. replicated? That's not Con- quite the same thing. Conceptual replication, right. So, so the idea is that um, in, in psychology, which, you know, which doesn't have the benefit of dealing with very hard, tangible, reliable constructs. So it's not looking at a gene or an animal or even a planet. It's looking at um, people's minds in all their sort of hazy, nebulous glory. Um, and and because, because it works on a lot of abstract constructs, um, it needs to... It, it, it often runs into trouble re- uh, repeating experiments across different populations in different times. So, you know, you, you do the same experiment in different group of people and it may be, um, and you might get very different results, not f- because the, um, your original experiments were, were crap, but because um, you're just doing it in a very different bunch of people. Now, um, one way of getting around this is to, uh, is to do sort of different experiments um, that tests the same underlying idea. So in terms of priming, for example, you know, we, we've talked about an experiment showing that priming people with uh, age-related words makes them walk more slowly down a corridor. Now, that in itself isn't particularly exciting. You know, no, no. one, no one um, started off going, what we really want to know is what, what conditions would make people walk more slowly down a corridor. That is not an exciting research question. What is exciting is the, the underlying idea of, you know, do, can unconsciously presented stimuli affect people's behavior? So s- the slow walking study is one test of that, but you could do lots of other tests, and people have done lots of other tests. Um, and in, in psychology, it is, it's in, or at least certainly in certain sub-disciplines, it seems to be common practice to say, take all these disparate um, ex- attempts to test the same underlying concept and go, well, they, they effectively replicate each other. So they, they support each other. Does that, does that yeah, make no, that sense? Yeah, that explains it. It's just uh, – I don't – as a person who's um, run a lot of regressions in, in, in my youth, right. um, I, I know about the tendency both consciously and subconsciously to convince yourself that this is the right – version of the test. This is the right specification of the equation in the case of, case of, of regression analysis. And in the case of these shadowy things, what I suspect happens – There's of course, there's fraud occasionally. That, that's, yes. But fraud's not the real problem because no. fraud – you can find fraud and you can actually see fraud when you do find it. The real problem is what you might call subconscious fraud. It's when – Exactly. You run the equation and you real, and they don't get any effect. And you think, well, priming is true, of course. So obviously, I didn't use the right words. I didn't. I had a funny population. These were sophomores. I should have had seniors. I should have had a wider group. They knew each other. It's very easy to convince yourself that there's something that didn't go right here. And so what you do then is you redo the, the study and you change the words. Instead of saying old, you say very old or. Uh, a, a septuagenarian instead of a senior citizen, or you use right, some, yeah. and then. The problem is, of course, as Ed Lemer in economics has pointed out, we've interviewed him on this program about it. We'll put a link up to it for this podcast. The problem is, is that once you start f- altering the uh, terms of the experiment that way, the classical tests of significance no longer hold. And so Indeed. by pure randomness, you're going to get statistically significant results if you run 50 or 100 studies. Of, and then, then that's the one that you convince yourself, well, that was the right one because, of course, it showed priming is true, as everyone knows. Right, and right. So, and, 
Yeah, so so there are there are a couple of problems here, I think. So so I re- ended up writing a piece, a feature for Nature about this, um, about the the wider issue of replication and and these and publication bias, and and you know there are definitely a couple of big problems here. What one is that um, it seems that almost uh, culturally commonplace um, for people to do these tweaks, these things that you talk about that you've just mentioned. So things like. Um, you know, checking your significance level during your experiments and then, you know, stopping at the point where you get a significant result or, you know, not deciding a priori how big your sample test should, size should be or what your statistical test should be. So you're sort throwing of making... Out, or throwing out an outlier. Oh, that one, oh, that guy, you know, he didn't count. And, right, right. Yeah. So, so you're making quite on-the-fly decisions about how to run the experiments in ways that basically virtually guarantee a positive result. Um, and firstly, we know that this is incredibly easy. So there's a guy called um, Joe, uh, Joe Simmons who's done a really interesting study on this. He, he outlines these what he calls um, researcher degrees of freedom. Uh-huh. And um, he applied them to a, a genuinely collected data set that he, that he, that he had um, and used it to show, quote unquote, that um, people who listened to uh, When I'm 64 by the Beatles <laughs> – actually became one and a half years younger. So not felt one and a half years younger, actually physically de-aged by one and a half years. It's a miracle. And we always knew knew the Beatles were a great musical group, but it turns out they're even better than that. I know. How how amazing. Um, So, so... um, so you know this was published it was a very it was done in a very tongue in cheek way and joe's point is that um you know it is very easy to to produce these uh, statistically significant apparently positive results by kind of playing around with your data set now it it can happen and then there was another paper by a woman called leslie john who showed that it does happen and she did a survey of lots of different psychologists and um many of them admitted to exactly these things you know and by many we're talking like I don't know, 40, 50% admitting to, to a lot of these tweaks. So they're, they're commonplace. People think they're defensible. This, hap- this came out a lot in the discussion um, that followed my, uh, my sort of tete-a-tete with um, John Barge, where people were saying things like, you know, I, I, I've tried to replicate experiments before. Um, you know, a lot of these replication attempts fail, and I don't really think that much of it. Um, you know, for, for, for all these reasons. So that's one thing. And the second thing is that um, it is perhaps a little bit more understandable but still very problematic, which is that psychological experiments are, are often very difficult to conduct. Yeah, um, they're expensive. So, yeah, they're, they're, well, they're, actually, they're probably not that expensive. You know, you, you do them on grad, on grad students. You use grad students to do them. But they're, 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 they're difficult to conduct because... You know, people are different. People are weird um, and and very variable. Um, and uh, all kinds the, of subtle things matter: the intonation of the voice, the look. The, you know, unless you had a videotape of how some of this was gathered and, and watched the eyebrows of the of the researchers and the the people running the experiment, you, you might miss subtle clues that encourage certain results. It's very exactly. hard, very hard to truly replicate an experiment. Exactly, um, um, and you know, small small things matter. Now, um, one of the one of the people I interviewed for my Nature piece was Daniel Kahneman, who's a, a Nobel uh, winning uh, economist. Yes, and, and I have and, to mention that my wife just uh, finished his book, and she right, mentioned sure. to me that he cites the Barge study uh, approvingly. <laughs> uh, absolutely, he's you know he's he's very supportive of that line of research. I, I spoke to him about it. Um, his point is he he felt um, and he said to me that. Um, he he personally wouldn't repli- wouldn't try and replicate um, Barger's studies because he doesn't think that he has the skill or know how to do so. So his Kahneman would argue that um, in priming studies, because the entire idea rests on the fact that you are in unconsciously experiencing these stimuli, if you in some way draw people's attention to the fact that they've been primed, the effect no longer works. So. Um, you need to very carefully orchestrate the study so that people aren't aware of what's actually happening to them. And, you know, he, um, he talks about uh, a knack that Barge has and yeah. that his students have um, to, to pull these sorts of things off. Now, That's one name for it. it, it <laughs> right, right? Confirmation right. bias would be the other. It's, right, uh, right, right. it's a big challenge. Yeah, it is. It is a big challenge. I mean, this is the thing. How do you? How do you? 
th- there is something to be said about that. I'm perfectly happy to accept that there is a degree of experimental skill and artistry yep. um, in, in pulling these things off. No doubt. But on the other hand, that's a very easy out. It's dangerous for, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, for, for someone who... Who isn't? Who doesn't have that, and is actually, you know, pulling a fast one? Then that that gives a very easy excuse. Now, I'm not by any means saying that either Kahneman or Barge is guilty of this, but it, the the fact that this idea is out there creates this environment in which it's very easy for these sorts of um, dodgy cases to happen. Um, and you know, you you talked about fraud. One of the things I mentioned in my nature piece was the case of Diedrich Stapel. So. Um, he, he is a, a social psychologist. He was a social psychologist at the University of Tilburg. He was, by all accounts, a rising star in his field. And we now know that he, he was guilty of fraud on a massive, massive scale. He was fabricating data. Um, he did so in at least 30 papers, probably more. Um, you know, and he, he was claiming to find these effects that, that just weren't real. He wasn't even doing the experiments. It's handy. Uh, right. That, that that certainly lowers the cost. I, I, as you talk about <laughs> as you talk about the artistry of this, and and, it, and again, there's there's a certain culture that is the, that accrues through graduate school, and it certainly happens in economics. I'm sure it happens in social in all the social sciences and all the sciences. There's a certain respect for that artfulness. Uh, there's a certain skill. There is uh, running an experiment, doing statistical analysis is not a recipe driven, manual driven ac- activity. There's an art to it. And right. certain artful techniques are applauded, and perhaps uh, a thoughtful person realizes that they're they're dangerous. And as you talked about uh, Kahneman's hesitancy to to replicate some of these studies because that's not his skill set of of this kind of artfulness, uh, I, I'm I, I'm reminded of Richard Feynman's quote, which is the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. Right. Uh, yeah. It's such a dangerous. Uh, activity for a so-called scientific researcher to trust in his own artfulness and to claim, for example, certainly for himself to claim or herself to claim that 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 others can't replicate my work. I'm <laughs> I'm too skilled at it. Just stand back and and applaud. Uh, now, now I should clarify here that I've I've actually spoken to to Barger about this, and he doesn't. He that's not what he says about his own work. Uh, he he very clearly said to me that. Um, you know, he 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 doesn't want there to be any sort of secret knowledge, and uh-huh. perhaps um, perhaps what this means is that method sections in psychological psychological papers should you know be given more space so that authors can more clearly lay out all the conditions that sure. need to actually be followed in order to you know to 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 replicate a study. So, in fairness to to John, you know, it's he's not he's not the one claiming that he's got some special knack. I think True. you know what's dangerous is when people attribute this to, to other scientists. So, you know, when you look at the, um, the, um, the report from the investigation committee that rules on the Starpol incident, they very clearly say, you know, when very few people tried to replicate his studies, and when they did, if they failed, they assumed that it was because he had some skill that they hadn't. And, and there you have it. You know, people are actually doing the work necessary to check whether this stuff is true, they're not finding it, and they're thinking, "Well, it's probably my fault." Um, and and this, you know, this nicely ties back into the, what we talked about at the start of this about conceptual replication. So, on on in in the theoretical sense, you can see why it's a powerful idea because you're showing that individually um, a, a acquired pieces of data and and results. Um, in very different settings, in different countries, in different groups of people, are finding similar thematically relevant things, um, and that that bolsters the the underlying concept. But that only works if each individual piece of data is solid in itself. If it, it hasn't been acquired through these degrees of freedom that we talked about, if if it hasn't been pu- if they haven't been published because of um, the, the desire and the bias towards um, sexy new results. And, and assuming that all those things happen, which we know they do, then actually what, you, what you've got are lots of studies which individually could have appeared because of publication bias, then supporting each other, which, as you say, is, is just the very epitome of confirmation bias. And if you're on the other um, side, it's a feature, not a bug, because, hey, look how rich the idea is. It, it just it, – it, it applies everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Right, right, right. So, you so know, when, that, we, when we talk about – when you talk about publication bias, you're talking about the fact that, 
it, there's not a lot of uh, – there's a huge incentive to get published. And in general, it's easier to publish positive results than negative results, correct? Exactly, yes. Um, you know, and this, this is for, for many different reasons. It's, it's because of pressures from the journals, um, academic pressures on scientists and their careers. Yep, yeah. it, it's by no means uh, a problem that is unique to psychology, although nope. psychology may have you know, certain, certain issues with it. I mean, psychology has kind of an interesting history of publication bias because one of the first real attempts to quantify it came from, um, came within psychology. It was by a statistician called um, uh, Sterling who um, found, uh, I can't remember the, date, the actual date now, I think it was in, sometime in the 50s, and he found that um, the majority of papers in uh, some big psychological journals. Um, oh, here we go. So 1959, he found that 97% of studies in four major psychology journals were reporting statistically significant positive results. Um, you know, by, by anyone's measure, that is too many. <laughs> and uh, when Sterling repeated his analysis, um, you know, several decades later in the 90s, it was, it was virtually the same. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it is a problem. I think individually, all of these things are a problem. You know, the, the, an over-reliance on conceptual replication rather than direct replications, um, the, the, the degree of freedom issue of, um, you know, tweaking studies on the fly, the issue of publication bias, the fact that when you actually replicate a study, it can be very difficult to, to know what that means. You, but synergistically, all of them, I think, work together to, to enhance each other's failings. Yeah, no, I agree. Now, this, this problem, I, I like to pick on psychology because the reason I do, by the way, is, is not because it's a sister social science that I look down on, although that's true sometimes. <laughs> I have to confess, occasionally, when I was younger especially, I, I, had, um, I had the arrogance of economics over, social, over the other social sciences, and now I'm, I'm actually uh, – I've evened things out. I, I've, I've, I'm less up. I'm less uh, confident about economics insights statistically and in terms of data. But um, it's not just a psychology problem. The reason it bugs me the most in psychology is because these books get published and my friends read them and they talk about how cool these results are. And I always say, do you really think those are true? <laughs> right, <laughs> Have you yeah. ever thought about whether they're reliable? Uh, and they yeah. don't because, of course, they confirm their own biases or they, they love – we all love novel results or counterintuitive results. And it's a huge right. problem in economics as well. But I think much more troubling than the psychology literature's problems uh, are those in economics and those in epidemiology. Mm. Um, a recent study found that you – know, and I wasn't – I have not looked at this carefully. And of course, you have to be skeptical of all studies, even those, <laughs> right. even those that are yeah. skeptical of studies. Right, but this, right, was right. A stu this was a study that looked at – that identified 53 landmark studies in cancer research. And f allegedly 47 of these 53 – 47 – could yeah. not be replicated. And the yeah. part that, that I found that, that really, of course, confirmed my own biases, so again, you have to be careful here, is that <laughs> the author, Begley, said um, – was talking to one of the figures who had done one of these studies that couldn't be re replicated. And he said, quote, we went through the paper line by line, figure by figure. I explained that we redid their experiment 50 times and never got their result. So I'm interrupting here to remark 50 yep. times. That's a good – gave it a good shot. Yeah. And then the quote continues. He said they'd done it – he, meaning the author of the original study that had made the claim. He said they'd done it six times and got this result once, but put it in the paper because it made the best story. And yeah. that yeah. really sums up the problem. I mean, good grief. We're talking about cancer research. We're talking That's about something that you – know, it's one thing to say, oh, people can be primed by language or you put people in a blue room. They're more creative. I don't, you know, I don't believe – these kind of studies, I think, until they've been replicated. But, but cancer research, which is people read and they get scared and they, they actually change their lives by right, what they yeah. eat and what they do, it's kind of more yeah. important. And they've got the same problem. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I used to work in, um, in I used to work in a cancer charity, so this is this stuff is kind of, this stuff weighs heavily on my mind. Um, and we used to talk a lot about epidemiological studies. Um, now. You know, I think you're. I think you're right that you, one has to be a bit wary about about um, studies that look at other studies, and especially in this case because it's a you know it's it's industry funded stuff. We yep. still don't know which of those 
53 studies have or have not replicated because that that data is not being publicly publicly released, which I find you know wonderfully ironic. Yes, true. Um, but but you're right. I think it, it does it does uh, point to um, perhaps some systemic problems. Um, and and you know there's there's the famous work by um, John Ioannidis. Um, yep. Who you know who claims that most um, most men, most published uh, find, scientific findings are, are probably not true, and he's you know he's talking about uh, the uh, medical research, and he's talking about he's using he's basing his argument on statistical logic, but you know you do see these um, pieces of data um, in psychology and you know in cancer research in all these fields, which suggests that there there are problems there, um, you know, and I would hate to for listeners to come away from this thinking you know. Science, science isn't true. Science can't be trusted. You know, a lot of this does kind of come out of the woodwork. I mean, what what I'm interested in are the are I, I'm interested in whether there are in situations where there are cultural norms that make it much harder for that to happen. So you know, science is meant to be a famously self-correcting process. Um, under what conditions does it fail to correct itself? And, and you know that's why I focused on psychology because I think it has it provides some interesting case studies there. Yeah, and you raise an interesting issue which I, which fascinates me. Which uh, I've I have noted a large uh, defensiveness on the part of scientists in these issues because they're afraid that if if we find that science isn't as scientific as we thought it was, maybe that opens the door toward religion and superstition supposedly, and I think. The alternative is much worse to to fool people or to be dishonest with people about the limits of of scientists as opposed to the limits of science. They're very right, different. Yeah. They're very different things. Science is is a is one of the great achievements of the human mind, but what it consists of that is reliable that we can act on and use is much more complicated. And and it's uh, but I do think there's a cultural pushback from the scientific community uh, to to uh, be very very careful. About publicly criticizing um, scientific results because they're afraid of the cultural implications. I, I mean, y- yes and no, and we should definitely come back to this because I think it ties into the issue of science journalism, which I know you wanted to talk yeah, about. Yeah, we get to that um, next. But um, you know, yeah, it, it feeds in quite nicely to that. But um, one thing I did want to point out is another reason why I, I decided to write this piece about psychology is not because you know I wanted to write a hit piece about this field or because I wanted a slate of psych- slate psychologists, but because one of the ways in which I think psychology stands out is that there are lots of people who are talking openly about this. Yeah, it's you know, true. There are, uh, uh, every, every single person I quoted in my piece, including all the ones saying we have big problems here, are psychologists. You know, they're not outsiders having a go. Right. Uh, they're people within the field taking a sort of introspective look. And there does seem to be more of this stuff going on. You know, uh, that some of the, the – I have quotes which didn't actually make it into the piece, which I think sum it up well. You know, one, one guy – I'm not going to say who these – people's names are because I'm not sure I have the actual quote in front of me. But one, one person said something like, if, you know, if someone handed me a result that I had no idea about um, and it was statistically significant, I would, my probably default state at the moment would be to question whether it was true or not. Um, and someone else said, you know, I, I like to... Um, I like to put my graduate students with a, with a thought experiment at the start of each year, which is if, if all the scientists in the world suddenly died, you know, if all the psychologists suddenly died and all we had to go on to, to sort of restart the field was the published literature, would we be in good shape? And the answer is probably not. It's a great thought experiment. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a macabre thought experiment. Um, <laughs> yes, but, but, economics, but instructive, yes. Economics has the same problem, right? Here we have... And by the way, that, that, that quote, that semi-quote, whatever you want to call it, that, that opinion yeah. uh, that you'd be skeptical of anybody telling you some result, well, that that's, should be the attitude of any scientist, right? It, yeah, it should never be, oh, thank goodness you finally confirmed, or I'm so right, glad right, that's right. true, or it should be, well, that's interesting. Well, let's see if it stands up. That, that should be – that's the scientific attitude, it seems to me, in any fields, whether it's psychology, economics, epidemiology. Um, and I, let's segue uh, – I want to mention one epidemiology study in particular, and, and we'll use this as a segue into the journalism issues. Uh, the study came out in the last few years about the uh, perils of alcohol consumption for women, mm-hmm. and it, it was a massive study. It was done in, in uh, the UK. It was uh, I, I, 
if I remember correctly, it was over a hundred thousand, uh, well over a hundred thousand uh, people in the sample, which means, in I think, in some people's minds, well, then it must be reliable. Which of course it has yeah, nothing right, to do right. with it. It's nice, but yeah. it was a massive study of, of of women's health, and the the researchers discovered that uh, even small consumption of wine and and liquor, I think it was one as little as one drink a week, raises mm-hmm. your risk of an, a whole <clears throat> an enormous list of types of cancers. And one of the – that study was on the front page of, of numerous newspapers uh, when it broke, and the journalists, of course, covered it with, with great zeal. The highest level of skepticism that I found was toward the end of the, of the article, you'd sometimes see an interview with someone who'd say, well, yeah, but drinking wine is probably good for your heart. We've, that's been shown. So you know, the tr- they probably cancel themselves out, and mm-hmm. so if you like to have a nice – a uh, glass of wine with your meal, you're probably okay. <laughs> that, that, that was the highest level of maybe we right, should yeah. consume this with a grain of salt. So I went and actually looked at the study. I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, there were a number of strange things in the study, one of which was they had data on uh, family uh, prevalence of cancer in the family, which they did not use, strangely mm-hmm. to me, in the, in the statistical analysis. But the strangest thing was they sort of you know this this is one throwaway line or two lines in the middle of the of the long paper they said well we 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 threw out the people who didn't drink right and right. that's a strange thing to do why would you throw out of your sample the people who dramatically are going through the non treatment effect that you're looking at they're they're sort of the perfect group you want to look at they're the people who don't drink at all obviously you're also interested among drinkers is it true that the more you drink, the sicker or healthier you get? But you'd certainly right. want to look at non-drinkers. Well, they threw them out. Why? They said, well, you know, it's a, it's a retrospective study. When you ask people, uh, are you a drinker? How much, have you, how much have you had to drink in the last week or last month? I can't remember exactly how it was worded. Well, some of those people who said zero, well, they would have been drinkers before. So if we mm. – they, they, they didn't drink the last month or the last year, but maybe they became – teetotalers. Maybe they gave up alcohol. And so by including them in the study, we're contaminating the results, so we'll throw them out. Well, that's true. Of course, it's also true that people say they drink like a fish. Uh, it, those people could be people who didn't used to drink, but now maybe they've got a bad health situation or a thousand other things. And they've started drinking, and they really don't have a lifetime of heavy drinking behind them. So you can't mm-hmm. partially justify – and of course, strangely enough – the people who didn't drink had different cancer rates. They were lower – they were higher, excuse me, than the modest drinkers. But they justified throwing them out because they weren't reliable. So to me that – as soon as I saw that, I thought this, this is junk. This is not acceptable. But of course it's on the front page of every newspaper probably in the world. Certainly not every, but many, many prominent newspapers featured it, didn't have any caveats. And so women either reduced their drinking – or got less pleasure from it because they were afraid they were killing themselves. And it, it's incredible to me that the journalism community can't get to that. And I'm, again, I'm not an expert. Uh, all well, I, actually, so, so let, let me interject here. So yeah. um, th- this is it's an interesting one for you to pick because I, I used to work in a cancer charity and um, our, our bread and butter was to talk about um, – epidemiological studies like this to the press. So mm-hmm. um, I, I don't know whether which specific one on alcohol and cancer you were talking about, but um, chances are I've probably been interviewed about this before. Uh-huh. Now, um, my take is... Now, okay, so I, I, I get what you're saying about the people um, in the, the non-drinking category, but that, is a, that has been a sort of debate going on in this field for a while about this, the so-called sick-quitter effect. Um, so uh-huh. you, you get, you get a, an odd up you get a little odd tick on the left-hand side of the curve if you include people um, who, who used to drink really heavily, got very bad disease, and then cut down to nothing. Um, but my, my main point for, for the alcohol stuff would actually be, it, it reflects to me one of my big bugbears about science journalism, which is the, the uh, treatment of every new individual discovery as yes. <laughs> a, a sort of, you know, as an isolated the first one. data point. Yeah, the first um, one. We, we and know. this is particularly, particularly bad for epidemiology, which, you know, as we all know, it relies on strength in numbers. You've got, you've got lots of different studies. Do they find the same thing? Um, if they do find uh, the same thing, uh, you know, and maybe this is, ties into the conceptual replication stuff, but if, you find, if you're testing the same hypothesis again and again, um, 
and they find the same thing, then, then that tells you something. Absolutely. Um, and with, with alcohol and cancer, um, the, the International Agency for Research into Cancer, IARC, uh, which are a French organization linked to the World Health Organization, and it's, they, they hand out the sort of gold standard rulings about whether something um, convincingly causes cancer is a probable cause, a possible cause of that yeah. sort of thing. So they, they grade strength of evidence. They were saying that alcohol causes cancer, you know, in those terms, in that stark leak language, back about 20 years ago. And ever since then, there have been dozens, if not hundreds, of large epidemiological studies which all find the same thing. And it's not just that. You have studies um, looking into uh, <coughs> biological mechanisms. So is it, is it plausible that uh, alcohol that's causes real, cancer? Yeah, that's real science, by the way. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, understand. Yeah, it's one thing to say, well, we see a correlation, but, but to actually understand the mechanism, that would be better. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, do, is, is there a mechanism? And yeah, there are mechanisms. So, you know, th this is actually a, a pretty strong link. You know, if you look at the epidemiology... Based on observational studies, which are not randomized controlled trials, there's always going to be a certain degree of, um, of uncertainty there about the direction of cause, uh, causation. But I think most people will be happy accepting that, say, smoking causes cancer, and that's yep. based on observational evidence. Yep. Um, and the evidence for alcohol, while not as strong as smoking, is certainly stronger than most other risk factors out there. It's just that people don't know about it. Fair enough. Um, Fair and, and, and people don't know about it because every new report fails to mention this massive accumulation of data that, that's gone on since, you know, since the 80s. Fair enough. But I'll, 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 let me push back a little bit, which is, yeah. which is based on my conversation with uh, Gary Taubes right, on right. his research on uh, you know, diet and relationship between diet and health. Well, study after study shows that, that fat – uh, is is correlated with with heart or heart disease, right? And um, but maybe those studies are just the product of groupthink uh, and, and other incentives that we haven't thought about. Um, a, a desire to get along with what's thought to be the health, the, uh, the the received wisdom in the field. And if I really wanted to push it, uh, a lot of doctors I know think drinking is just evil. Uh, it's a toxin and you shouldn't be put in your body and they don't accept what an economist or others might accept as a trade-off between health and, and joy or other mm -hmm. issues. And it's like they, they think it's immoral to ride a motorcycle. I don't ride a motorcycle. Yeah. I think it's nuts. Uh, yeah. but, but, but I had a friend of mine who loved, who loved riding his motorcycle. He broke his leg and he went into the, the medical uh, – he went into the hospital and the doctor said, you know, I really am uncomfortable setting your leg. I, I'll do it but you know, because I have to. But the truth is I know you're just going to go do it again. And I thought, well, you know, that kind of misunderstands the nature of the human enterprise. But doctors look at the world differently sometimes, not all of them obviously, but they don't always look at the world the same way as, as other folks do. And so I'm, I'm very comfortable with the possibility. And of course, I, I like to drink now and then, Ed, I have to confess. Yeah, I, yeah. I have a scotch occasionally on the weekend. I, I don't think I have a drinking problem, but uh, I feel often that, that some, it's possible to me that some of this research is – shall I say, primed by the cultural <laughs> attitudes of the physicians? I, I'll tell you what, though. If, if, that, if that hypothesis were true, then the country, where, the country where you would get studies saying that small amounts of alcohol increase your risk of chronic disease would not be Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't think that our culture is really compatible with that viewpoint. Yeah. Um, no. But but, but, I, but I take I take your point. You know, this the, uh, the the general the general thing here is I think that that scientists are people, um, and and I think that people forget that. I yeah. think sometimes journalists Absolutely. forget that, even though it's really their job to sort of you know iron that out. Yep. And I think that. Um, I think scientists forget it too. You know, what's, what's fascinating to me is that there, there are endless arrays of scientists versus journalists debates. So scientists having a go at journalists for not getting science journalism correct and journalists having a go at scientists for, uh, I don't know, for, for demanding too much or for being too nitpicky or whatever. And, right. um, and I find that when this, when this happens, um, a, lot of, a lot of very sensible, very... Um, intelligent, well-informed scientists I know suddenly take, forget that a lot of their peers are full of it. 
you know, and that's something that they, they know in their, day, in their daily lives because they review terrible papers and they're on, you know, the blogosphere and on Twitter yeah. cr- criticizing terrible papers. So they know that there are other scientists out there who are, you know, shall we say, not agents of truth. Right. Um, but I think this gets forget- forgotten. I think it, it gets forgotten on both sides, um, but, but on both scientists but, and but, journalists. But let's put the details of this particular um, study and this issue of cancer and, and alcohol to the side right, for sure. a moment. I, I brought up the example, yes, to take a pot shot at, at how epidemiology works, but also the, the fact that whether the study is reliable or not, the way these are frequently treated in the media – is as truth coming down from from Mount Sinai. You know, th- th- this yeah, is yeah. just a divine pronouncement. A study has been done. A statistically significant result has been discovered. It's been refereed. Ergo, we have notched another uh, mark in the truth. Um, you know, right in, yeah. in, in search of truth. And and I think the lack of the thing that bothers me, and I'll let you talk about what bothers you about your profession because you're on the inside and I'm on the outside. It's a cheap shot on my part, maybe, but what bothers me isn't isn't as uh, you've written. It's not just the lack of statistical sophistication. It's the, the the willingness to suspend disbelief and skepticism in the face of these publication biases and other human biases we've talked about. And journalists stand between the public and they're the the bridge between the public and the and the scientist. Uh, and I s- wish they did their job a little differently. But uh, yeah, and, and I sure. think journalists, being human, are under the same uh, sometimes unhealthy incentives of publish quickly, publish splashy. Um, and I'd like to hear from you as, as a person with a great deal of experience in the field of published for a wide array of publications, how those incentives, how they work because they must be real. Yeah, I think um, – so So one thing I can't speak to is is what – you know, is the, is the pressures that um, – I don't know, a, a newsroom journalist would be under. And, and, you know, I think we're all familiar with that. They're under pressure to deliver a lot of copy under a lot, in, under very tight deadlines. They need to sell ideas to editors. So, you know, they might need to glam it up to people who uh, have no scientific knowledge whatsoever. They might have no scientific knowledge whatsoever. All these sorts of things. Um, you know, my, my back, I've fortunately never had to deal with this. My background is in, is in freelancing. Um, and I've, I've, you know, I write for a lot of places which I think have a very good sort of editorial sense. But I think that um, one, of, one of the issues is that, um, and it applies not just to science journalists, but to the, the wider area of science writing or science communication, is that a lot of people get into this because they love science. You know, that's, what I, that's how I got sure. into this. I, I wanted to talk to people about science. Um, and and I think when you go in with that mentality, when you start off, you you don't really it, the idea that a lot of this might not actually be true doesn't weigh upon your mind so much. You know, you're interested in the business of like explaining complex concepts to a to a lay audience. You're you're trying to make science accessible and and interesting and cool. Yeah. Um, you know, rather than playing that watchdog role. And, and your, I think your blog um, your blog does it very well, by the way. Thank you. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's I, a I lot do, of I, intellectual I, excitement there that has nothing to do with these issues of uh, you know reliability, statistical analysis. Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, thank you very much. I, I, when, I, when I started with the blog, that was very much my mindset. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to effectively translate these papers and present them in a very interesting way. And I think that the, the journalistic side of it has sort of appeared over, over many years, of, uh, you know, and, um, and it wasn't there to start off with. Um, and the, the 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 act of actually verifying whether something is true, you know, calling around, getting different people to comment on something. Um, I I always used to try and take a skeptical eye to what I read, um, but I think that's becoming more and more prominent with time. And I think it's it's a it's a hard job actually, and I think it's becoming harder um, the more complicated science gets. You bet. Um, so. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, the uh, w- one of the reasons why I, I take this a lot more seriously than I used to is um, is just is me just getting sick of 
having covered papers which ended up being fraudulent or retracted. Like surely, <laughs> yeah, surely I could have done something beforehand to, to yeah. check that out. And one one case um, involved a genetic study of um, variants that are associated with longer life. Okay. And this was published in Science, you know, one of the world's top flagship journals. Sure. And it was later retracted um, for, for, you know, we, uh, without going into the nitty gritty, basically not being true. <laughs> Um, now, at the time, I actually sent this paper out for comments um, to, to a bunch of people, uh, to a few gerontologists. So I'd just written a feature about long life and, and, you know, I knew a few people. And they all came back saying, yeah, great, great paper, very interesting results. And the minute it came out, people who are actually specialists in these genetic associations, so G- GWAS studies, just tore it apart. They, you know, people immediately said, well, hang on, there's something really fishy going on with your, your stats and your results here. Um, and that's what's hard, I think. Science is becoming very complicated. It's becoming very interdisciplinary. And you're, more and more, we're getting papers where you can't just hand them to a couple of people and say, well, is this kosher or not? Because firstly, they may not have the skills. They may, not know, like, they may only know one side of the field. Um, they may not have the statistical nous to know what's going on. Yeah. Or, you know, worst case scenario, an entire field may be in collusion with a sort of received line of thinking. So, you know, like, uh, so I don't, I don't want to make accusations here, but, you know, we've talked about the conceptual replication issue. So if lots of people are buying into the same concept and you get a new paper that's involved in priming and you send it out to a bunch of priming researchers. Yeah. Well, you it's know, what, problem. Yeah. What, what are they going to say? So... This act of um, verification, which I think is really important, involves you know, asking the right people the right questions and, and involves becoming incredibly knowledgeable about these fields yourself. And that is, that is increasingly hard as science becomes increasingly um, networked and, and, uh, and cross-disciplined. Well, let's talk about uh, the internet for a minute uh, and yeah. how that's changed things. I recently noticed that... Um, one thing that always intrigues me is uh, things that people know are true that turn out not to be true. Right. Uh, one of which is that the uh, life expectancy of a, a football player in the United States is 58. Uh, right. This, if you Google uh, life expectancy NFL um, 58, <laughs> right. I, I didn't have to add 58. I shouldn't have. But uh, if you Google that, you'll, you'll find article after article that says that according – and this is the quote – uh, according to the National Football Players, the National Football League Players Association, mm-hmm. uh, the average life expectancy for an NFL player is 58. Now, right. now the the NFL Players Association, of course, is not a scientific organization. They have a bias. They have an incentive to exaggerate the dangers of football to some extent to justify uh, programs that the NFL might provide for unhealthy or older players. Reminds me of the claim, which I hear all the time from uh, people who are uh, angry about it, that uh, America's infrastructure is gets a D. Uh, mm. be- its bridges and, and roads and et cetera are very unsafe. And how do we know that? Because the American Society of Engineers or whatever is their official name says so. Well, yeah, they would. That, that would doesn't mean it's not. It doesn't mean it is safe or that it really should get an A. But pe- yeah. if the people doing the grading are the people who profit from the result, you kind of need to be a little bit skeptical. So. I think Sports Illustrated recently looked at the life expectancy of NFL players. It's not 58. They, they, have, they seem to be healthier than the average American. I don't know if they live longer, but it's not 58. And they couldn't track down where that number came from. Yet that right, number yeah. now is truth. It gets repeated over and over and over again. Right, right, yeah. So uh, I, the internet, of course, makes that easier to discover and, and, and somewhat easier to refute. But it's an interesting effect. It does. Uh, you know what? What I what I'm actually very grateful to the internet for is is plugging me into a network of criticism, which you know, which was possibly always there, but maybe a bit invisible. So yeah. you know, you've got you've got scientists talking to each other about uh, crit- criticizing pieces that appear in the media, criticizing other papers, um, criticizing each other. Now, I think that this is spectacularly healthy because from from my point of view. It makes me a better journalist. I know more about um, – ever since I joined Twitter, ever since I became a part of the blogosphere, um, you know, I, I know more about the debates going on in the field. I know more about the methodological flaws um, to look out for. 
I, I, I know more sources. I know people who are, who are really solid on all these things who I can contact and ask for a second opinion. Um, and, and you learn so much about, about all the stuff that I think is really essential and really interesting. Um, and that may have been completely invisible before, but I think it's, it's out there now for people who want to see it. Um, the, the, the question, of course, is whether critiques actually reach as far as the original mistakes. And, you know, I think it's pretty clear that they, they actually don't. So, you know, that, that, that to me is the big thing. How, how, do, you, how do you make sure that the, the truth actually reaches as far as, uh, as the dodgy stats that you were talking about? Well, you know, I just, just to check that I wasn't confirming my biases, <clears throat> I, just, <laughs> right. I just re-Googled uh, NFL expectancy um, NFL life expectancy, and it pulls up the same studies that show that it's 58 or 53 to 59. I think the real problem, of course, is, is it's not the internet. The problem is, is you, you, and, you and I are the problem. Um, most right, of us yeah. don't really care about the truth, uh, yes. which is human. Um, we, we are interested in grinding an ax or feeling good about ourselves or feeling angry about something. So if you want to write an article about the NFL or if you hate football or you're worried about football players – that little fact that it's 58, whether it's true or not, isn't really the point. The point is we need to help these people, and that's just a weapon. And it, I grabbed it. It was laying there. I picked it up, that statistic. And if you told me it's not true, I'd, I'd feel bad about that. I'd, I'd find a different weapon, which are right. lying around elsewhere. And so I think you know the real problem with the, with the delay between correction and, and the, the, the truth is that – or the – excuse me, the correction and the lie is that People don't care, and I don't blame them. I understand right. that. It's, it's you know, <laughs> I, I can understand. I can understand why your average Joe or Jane doesn't care. I I find it absolutely galling when people who are supposedly journalists don't, because that is, you know, that's the mission. That's the job. Yeah. Professionally, we are people who are meant to care about that sort of stuff. And and what what really irks me is that a lot of the mistakes that get made are really tedious mistakes. You know, they're things like what we, exa- all the things we've talked about, just reusing stats without checking where they came from, not looking at, you know, who, where the vested interests might be, um, not, not calling people up, not, um, you know... Uh, interviewing a not, critic. Not <laughs> interviewing a critic, right, not, not presenting um, the context for a study. All these things have been talked again and again and again. If you look at any comment piece on science journalism, that's what people talk about. You know, those are the, the obvious mistakes. And I think that actually, like, like I said, with the fact that science is becoming very interdisciplinary and you don't necessarily know who the right experts are and, True. You, know, and you don't really know the methodological things you should be looking for, there are plenty of really interesting ways to screw up being a science journalist Yep. <laughs> you know, there, there are there there are many many ways of 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 making mistakes that that I think are maybe not more excusable, but but certainly you know more I don't know more advanced, more interesting. They're not they're not the the really boring things that people keep on saying all the time. The things that are, that could be avoided with a, a bare uh, you know a bare minimum of effort. Well, I'm gonna. Challenge you a little bit on on that those points. I, I agree with all ninety nine percent of what you said. The one percent, though, I want to I want to focus on because I think it's it's interesting. I, I think most economists, uh, most academics, most medical researchers, most physicists see themselves as searchers for truth, mm. but they don't act that way. That, that's mm. how we see ourselves. That that's a form of self deception. There's an element of truth to it. It's not a lie. But we, of course, are affected by hundreds of other things, our incentives to get published, to get tenure, to be famous, to be lauded, to be respected. And these things clash, obviously, and I think it's true of journalists too. So I've, 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 I've taught a lot of journalists, and, and they say what you just said with, with such fervor. Our job is to, is to seek the truth. That is, that is your job in some way, I guess. Um, it's certainly the way many journalists see themselves, but of course it's not exactly how they act. And that's because as an economist, I see their incentives to act truthfully are not always so strong. So true. to take That's an true. obvious example in, in political coverage, uh, <clears throat> if you tell a journalist that he's got a political bias, I don't think – I think it's like telling him he, you know, he, he's a child molester. It, it's the, one of the most horrifying things you can <laughs> right. accuse a yeah. journalist of. And their response isn't, no, I'm not biased. That's, that would be a violation of my ethical code. They get right. angry. Yeah. They yell at you. And of course, yeah. it's very important and I understand it. It took me a while to realize this, but 
journalists want to feel that they're searchers for truth, just like we economists and academics want to feel we are. But we need to sometimes step back and realize that sometimes the incentives working on us consciously and subconsciously are not are not so pushing us in that direction. And, and we ought to be maybe just being aware of the fact that that what we say about ourselves and how we actually behave are not not the same. True, and and I think this ties into you know the stuff that um, Jay Rosen um, and others have been banging on about for ages that that um, rather than having the sort of false veneer of impartiality or, or um, objectivity, um, journalists should embrace the idea of more of transparency yeah. and fairness. And and I think that's absolutely true. You know, I don't think that um, I think you're kidding yourself if you think that you are entirely apolitical or impartial or, or objective, but that doesn't stop you from being f- as fair as possible um, or, or of doing all the necessary um, bits of the job that allow you to produce truthful pieces of work. Uh, you know, I think as long as one acknowledges one's biases, um, that can be more powerful than sort of striving to to achieve some sort of weird neutrality, which, you know, which probably will never actually happen. Yeah. I've been trying that in economics. It's not very popular. Um, <laughs> right, my fellow yeah. economists get very angry when I suggest that, that they're biased as I am. They say, well, you're biased. Yeah, okay, you've admitted it, but I'm not like you. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm, right. I'm an impartial seeker of truth, and you're despicable. Um, I'm, yes. I'm carrying on. I'm going to keep claiming, uh, admitting my bias and um, and being proud of it rather than trying to hide it. Um, right, right. Uh, cultural norms bounce off my impenetrable <laughs> sheer shield of neutrality, my bubble of perfect objectivity yep. um, through which no bias can enter. Yeah, it's bizarre, but um, good for them. I say, you know, gosh, right, I, have right. to, I have to get her, I have to go buy one of those. I have to go find one of those, <laughs> right, those bubbles yeah. or shields because obviously mine isn't working. I got a bad. I got a bad. I got a defective one. <laughs> um, l- we're almost out of time. L- l- let me close. Let me ask you a couple things, and you could talk about either one, and and we'll close, or both if you feel like it. One is, what do you think might change the incentives, if anything, that the journalists face? Um, uh, you know, scientists. I-, I think it's very hard to change those incentives. Um, there is some pressure on journals to to offer replication, to publish data. At least it's a start. Um, but I think actually, I think people like you and others who are uh, Using the internet to remind people of these the, the possible unreliable uh, unreliabilities results put social pressure on folks to be more open and honest. I think that'll make a difference. But in journalism, I'd be interested in your thoughts, and then I'd like your thoughts on where you think um, what are going to be the interesting issues in science in the next few years that you're thinking about and studying. Put so, um, okay, in, two disparate in, questions. In journalism, how can we make things? How can we change the incentives? Well. Um, so I think broadly speaking, there, you know, you could think about it in two ways. You could praise the good stuff yep. and you could denigrate the bad stuff. Um, I think both of those are happening to some extent. Mm-hmm. Um, there's certainly a lot of bashing the bad stuff going on and increasingly more so. And I think that's quite, that's quite good, actually. You know, I, I, I don't particularly want my stuff bashed as, you know, more than any other journalist, but I think it keeps us on our toes. I think yeah. that's good. Um, it makes us it makes us better at what we do if we get if we get told why we screw up. Um, but I think um, I, I think s- it's certainly in some circles there is a bit of defensiveness against that. I think that has to go, and I think there's a lot of um, almost cliquey mutual defensiveness of yeah. journalists sort of you know uh, forming as kind of protective ring around each other. And I think that we should actually as a profession probably be more willing to point out each other's failings. And I, I see that happening on, on things like Twitter. There are, you know, watchdog sites like the Night Science Journalism Tracker. I think they do a very good job. And that, that sort of thing is, is, um, is very good. I think that the danger is when you start stop thinking about what it is we're actually trying to do and, and think of it as a kind of day-to-day grind when you're like a tradesman rather than a professional. Um, and I think keep, keeping a focus on the, the latter is probably quite important. But I think really, ultimately, it comes down to, you know, to, to readers. I think it would be yeah, good point. The thing, the thing, the biggest thing that would that would change what's going on is if people became more discerning readers. If they if they um, if they paid more attention to uh, material that actually went that extra mile and gave more context and did more of a, a job of verifying things. Um, if they if they 
shut out or if they just ignored the stuff that just rehashes press releases without so much as a quizzical eyebrow raise. Um, that's the you know that's the thing that's going to change stuff. Otherwise, we get the media that we that we deserve. And if we you know if we're not selective and if we're not um, if we're not demanding enough, then we end up with a with a poor quality of stuff. And I think it's not just um, it's not just you know the general public, whoever they may be, who are guilty of this. I think scientists and science writers and science communicators kind of are as well. Because of that natural tendency we have to to love science and want to see it being made fun and accessible, you know, I, I think that one of the most dangerous ideas in the science communication industry is this idea that you can only make... You know, you're, the only way of promoting science to people is by kind of presenting it as this... Um, exciting, happy, clappy, you know, <laughs> you know, you sit around the campfire singing Kumbaya and talking about how wonderful science is. I think it can be equally... There's a name for that. Too. It's called a religion. I'm a big fan, <laughs> I'm a big fan of religion. I'm a big fan of religion, but I don't... Uh, I think we should keep science out of that uh, cultural norm. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad you, you, you've gone for totally non-controversial subjects <laughs> right at the end of the podcast. I mean, that's, you know, we, we can just talk about that and get that over with in a couple of minutes. Right? <laughs> but, but yeah, I think, you know, I, I think it's equally interesting to show um, where scientists disagree um, and, and where studies may be flawed and what, you know, yeah. what else needs to be done. I think that's, that's an incredibly valid and actually fascinating way of getting people interested in it. Yeah. But anyway, so I'm, I'm rumbling a bit. So you, you right. also asked about... Um, what, what excites you about what's coming in science? Let's get away. Let's, I'm going to close on a cheerful note. So I, I want you to talk about what excites you about what's happening in science these days and what stories you're keeping an eye on. Um, okay. Uh, hmm. You know, the, the, things that, the things that really excite me kind of creep up on me. Um, they're, they're, not, they're never really the types of things I expect. So I can give, I can give some obvious answers, right? So, you know, there have been a lot of studies recently um, showing breakthroughs, and I, I use the term very carefully, but I think it's fair to call them breakthroughs, that, that almost belong in the realm of science, science fiction. So, you know, paralyzed people gaining control of robotic limbs, um, studies showing that in mice, yes, but, but showing that you can do things like regrow damaged optic nerves, you can convert um, scar tissue in damaged hearts to beating heart muscle. This is, you know, this is incredible stuff, and it's, it may not be there yet in terms of widespread human use, you know, lots of research, yada, yada, but it's, it's a first step, and it's, it's very exciting. It's stuff that we couldn't do before. But then... A lot of the a lot of things I write about on my blog are nothing to do with that. And actually, if you if I if I look at my traffic, the posts that get the most hits are never really the ones involving the big breakthroughs that are going to save loads of lives and help loads of people. They're usually the odd bit of science, Quirk, um, the quirky uh, stuff. The quirky stuff, yeah. That that just makes you kind of go wow at, at the natural world. So, you know, an, an example, I, I blogged um, last week about a paper in, about whales um, showing that uh, the biggest whales, the, the rorquals, so that's blue whales, fin whales, um, you know, humpbacks, they have a sense organ at the front of their lower jaw that no one had known about. And it helps them coordinate the movements of their jaw bones and the muscles in their mouths when they open their mouths to swallow big gulps of food, like a, a fin whale can swallow as much water as an entire as an as another fin whale. So you can basically swallow another whale, and to coordinate all the big movements that you need to do that, it's got this thing this, that's about the size of a volleyball that's loaded with nerves and blood vessels in the front of its mouth that takes in. Um, information from uh, the bones and, and the muscles and the cartilage and, se- and helps it control <coughs> how it opens its mouth. Um, this is amazing. These, these creatures are familiar. They are, you know, they've been the subject of endless natural history programs. Their skeletons are on display. You know, people have hunted them for decades, and we have only just discovered that they have this thing the size of a football in the front of their heads hmm. that we just didn't know about. And, and to me, that's... That is that is really exciting. That that's the type of stuff I live for. You know, mm-hmm. new new and exciting things that may show us how much we have left to understand about the stuff around us. And did you uh, 
And how did how was that discovered? Um, it was uh, well. It's it's an interesting story. It was a bunch of um, scientists who were uh, trailing um, a Japanese whaling vessel. And, you know, you've got all these remains that are, are then discarded and they used that opportunity to try and they were going to conduct a very thorough study of the musculature and the anatomy of the jaw, um, which no one really had done before. Hmm. Um, and, they, and they found this thing and they went, hang on, that's, that's a bit strange. It's cool. Um, so there's, you know, there's stuff like that. There's the there's the odd discoveries that take you by surprise. Um, in in a similar vein, at the end of last year, and people have discovered that um, elephants have a sixth toe in their foot and their feet that kind of acts like a, a, a heel. And so an elephant foot is like a big platform shoe. They walk on tiptoes, but they've got this gigantic fat pad which the 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 heel sits on, which cushions their. Um, their footfalls. I don't know if you've ever actually seen an elephant in the wild. They're like ninjas. You can't hear them. Wow. Um, even though they're, they're massive and you expect them to quake the earth when they walk, they actually, they're completely silent. Unless <laughs> they step a twig, you never know one was there. Um, and, and it turns out that there's a little toe which juts into this foot pad, a fat pad and gives it extra support. Again, the thing that we didn't know about, despite the fact that these animals are incredibly well studied and have been dissected you know, many times over, um, it, it's completely new. Um, and and I I find that sort of thing endlessly fascinating. So do I. My guest today has been Ed Young. Ed, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.